Um, hey, hey, I like this. I'm, I'm picking up expressions. My favorite Irish one is not a bother. So you, you ask how somebody is, and they say, not a bother. Um, you ask how uh, they're going to do something, and they say, not a bother. So I'm adopting expressions all over the world. Um, freedom and light. Uh, one of the best things about a new job is that you can avoid the worldly mire. Uh, you haven't been involved in, in it. You can actually move freely without any of the previous baggage um, and any consideration for the politics and the relationships uh, that go on. Um, mostly, you are forgiven for not knowing um, and you are listened to without prejudice. I'm trying to keep that up for as long as possible. So already, I feel I've got some freedom and light. I'm really going to talk to you, however, about the freedom that opening up uh, has given us and the light that has, shine, uh, has shone on our uh, collections. I was taken on at the hunt because of my digital background. The board was looking for someone who could take the museum into the, uh, to move it forward, um, at least bring it into the, the 21st century, and to play a part in the urban regeneration of Limerick through culture. And there are three key advantages to taking up this position. Was I on that slide? I'll move on to this one then. Um, these were the three key advantages. So in theory, I had a nice blank sheet. <laughs> but of course, these are also disadvantages. They had nothing, really nothing. Poor quality images, bad metadata, the type that calls a photo a photo and then describes it as a photo. They didn't mention it was a Bronze Age shield or an Irish drinking vessel. They also had no concept of copyright, um, or no understanding of it, no ability to apply it. The collection on our website was unsearchable. That's actually still the case. The staff and the museum board members are really great, very committed people, but very rooted in the physical world conservation, preservation, visitors as bodies that actually walk through the door. Digital was a, it was a big cultural change, seen very much as, a, as an add-on to their workloads, um, and that they were being asked to change by what they call a blow-in, which is actually Irish for foreigner. Uh, they, and then on top of that, of course, was my own ignorance, which was uh, phenomenal. And yes, of course, I, I know the jargon. I know the, um, uh, I know why a collection management system is important. Um, I know why you need highly descriptive metadata to improve the discovery. And obviously, as one of the open glamours before open glam was even actually a thing, uh, the importance of open licenses and right statements. Um, but actually, I don't know how to do anything. This is really true. I'm not making this up. David will confirm that. Um, and I had a staff that I was actually supposed to teach uh, how to do these things. So it was all something of a, of a challenge. Um, so I started with strategy, aiming to get us all in the right, on the same page, moving towards at least some kind of common goal, common vision. But in parallel, I had a bit of a break um, on the open front helping to prove that the, the merits of uh, open collections online. I'm going to digress for a, a couple of slides. I arrived at the beginning of April uh, 2018, and at the beginning of May, the Hunt Museum was staging an exhibition of one of our three collections. It was a, a fashion uh, uh, collection, as you see here, by um, an Irish uh, fashion designer, Sybil Connolly. She was from the 1950s. Um, an amazing entrepreneur. Uh, she started in fashion um, using Irish fabrics, uh, so Donegal tweed, Limerick and Caracamore lace, pleating handkerchief uh, linen for her dresses, 
And from very humble beginnings, she ended up designing for Jackie Kennedy Onassis, uh, for Elizabeth Arden. She worked with Vogue and uh, later with Tiffany's for her ceramics and her, her glassware. The Hunt Museum has, thanks to her nephew, a collection of about 40 or so of her garments, as well as pattern books, sketchbooks, uh, swatches, some glass, some ceramics, memorabilia. And the exhibition can only show part of, of that collection and only to those who are walking through the door. So my first thought was, okay, how do I extend the audience? How do I create a new audience uh, for this? The collection was obviously still in copyright, but it was a great one to get high-res photos of and to get online. But we weren't 70 years after the death of the author, and it was therefore legally still fully in copyright. So we rang her surviving relative, the nephew. One of the fantastic things about Ireland is you can ring anybody and you get through to them. This is what he said. It's your collection. I gave it to the museum. Do what you like with it. Don't, I don't claim any copyright. So consulting nobody, this is a management technique. Um, it's also known as forgiveness. Um, I dedicated it to the public domain with a CC0 license, got the photos taken by a professional photographer, and started the process of sharing Sybil so her work could be used in education, research, um, and designers. That meant that we uh, had a wiki editathon with uh, the Irish Wikipedian Rebecca O'Neill, placed the images on the wiki commons. This is where our docents, our, our volunteers, wrote some articles and we got the collection up online. With the results that we were the first Irish glam to go into uh, wiki uh, commons, and I was able to create an online exhibition at the same time in parallel with the physical exhibition. Uh, this uh, exhibition has gone on being really useful. It's used, uh, we know, in teaching courses in three US uh, universities. And we will reuse it as part of uh, an exhibition that we're doing next year, which is with the Irish Costume Association, who do the costumes for films, um, things like Game of Thrones, etc., etc. Troy Studios is down the road uh, from us. So it really has reuse internally as well as um, externally. Um, it, uh, the stats, I think, really do speak uh, for themselves. And I'll come back to how this worked in my favour when asking to make our entire collection available in the public domain. The other benefits were things like direct connections with the lace uh, community across Ireland, access to a small grant with North South to digitise the lace pieces in the Sybil Connolly uh, collection, and actually the potential of taking this um, to New York. And um, we're talking to the Met because they've got some Sybil Connolly uh, dresses. Um, and that gives me then access to a new funding stream and the Irish diaspora. So there are many reasons why this was useful. So back to strategy. Um, this was also a clean sheet when I arrived. Uh, lots going on, a really amazing education department, very strong community links, uh, some great exhibitions, but no sense of uh, focus and uh, no knowledge of any kind of impacts and certainly no digital strategy. Nothing um, about digital within the strategy, which is probably a better way of putting it. So I had the usual round of workshops with everyone and their dogs, um, and I nicked what is best out there in the world. Uh, Mike Edson, who many of you will know, um, had put together the UN Live Museum strategy with the line, a modern museum needs to operate on three platforms, physical, virtual, and human. Perfect, fantastic framework. All I needed to do was to fit what we were doing into it and really create an integrated plan where nothing stands uh, separately. And actually, as a bit of an aside uh, to this, um, the Sybil Connolly was a very good example of um, the, you're working with your network, you are 
this is going to be entertaining me getting to here. You're working with your network you, um, to create the articles. You have your collection within the physical building, but you're also pushing it out online as a, as a digital phenomenon. So I'm just going to show you a short video of the strategy. At the Hunt Museum, we want to change lives with culture, creativity and learning. We want to use our vibrant, edgy, creative museum to make lives better through active participation in cultural heritage. A modern museum needs to operate on three platforms. This is our building, the digital world, and our networks or community. Taken together, the three platforms can deliver our strategy of growth. By 2025, we will have helped boost pride in the region's cultural heritage, gained international recognition for our collections, created new technology partnerships, innovated in the sector and for the museum, touched the hearts and minds of local and international audiences, improved people's well-being and learning. We've created four priorities for our next six years. Collections, public engagement, innovation and funding. We cannot do this alone, so together with our network of friends and our docent volunteers, we will collaborate and partner with universities, museums, cultural organisations, social media and learning platforms, creative hubs, tourism enterprises and others across the world. Simply put, we will open up access to our collections via all three platforms, increase our public engagement and through innovation, broaden our reach and influence. We imagine the Hunt Museum as a centre of learning and civic life, a multifaceted destination that attracts, educates and inspires tens of thousands of people over and over again. For our full strategy 2025, please visit www.huntmuseum.com. Uh, one of the things that I did in that strategy, it was a line that I added in, was this one. We want to open up these collections to new audiences, new uses in schools, universities, creativity and tourism by making available in the public domain almost everything that we hold. Now, to get that past I, my three boards, I've actually got three boards, it's a whole other story, I blinded them with copyright. I used the work of Doug and Andrea. I um, uh, made use of the work of Europeana, obviously, and our pioneers, so SMK, uh, Kunstengewerbe, the Biblioteca Catalunya, um, University of Ghent, uh, the National Institute of Sound and Vision in the Netherlands, and of course, the, the Rijksmuseum. And I prepared a paper um, using my Sybil Connolly as an example, and I thought I would have opposition. Um, this is a family donated collection. The Hunt collection is 2,000 pieces um, stretching from Egyptian uh, times right the way through uh, to uh, end of the med medieval period. It's something that they feel enormous ownership about that actually I still have on one of my boards a member of the family um, involved in it. And the other members of the boards have been there since the beginning of the museum 21 years ago. And they also have this incredibly strong sense of this belongs to us. We, we have uh, a vested interest in what, what happens to it. Um, however, there was only one person on there that actually understood uh, anything about uh, reproduction rights. And anything that we had earned from reproduction rights had been hidden under the miscellaneous sales tag. It was so small, it really wasn't worth looking at. Which means that not one of them uh, actually dissented in the decision. I'm not sure that they actually know what they really agreed to. Um, but they are seeing the results and the increase in online visitors and real social media take up. We've still got an awful lot to do to get the collections online, but we are moving in the right direction. So we've got a 600% increase in the use of the website, we're tripling of our social media um, and the like. However, you'll be pleased to know it is not all plain uh, sailing. 
Um, this summer we have an exhibition of Lavery and Osborne, two Irish painters of the uh, 19th, early, early 20th century. Osborne was born in 1859, died in 1903, Lavery 1857 to 1940. Most of the collections that we borrowed for this were from private uh, uh, collections. Very good, because they hadn't seen the light of day, public hadn't seen them. To make the digital and the physical works work together, again, I wanted to do a online exhibition. Actually, it didn't turn out very well as an online exhibition, so we turned it into uh, a story, which we have released in uh, chapters. These are contemporaries of Roderick O'Connor, uh, Gauguin, Van Gogh, um, they, Julien Le, Bastien Lepage, who uh, was one of the exponents of the uh, uh, En Plein Air movement. They studied in Antwerp, uh, parts of uh, Brittany, Paris, and they recorded some very big moments in history. Uh, Lavery was very involved in recording the First World War um, and also in things like the Irish Uprising or the Irish War of Independence, depending on what side you're uh, coming from. We also had a series of social media campaigns. Um, revived an old favorite, Van Gogh Yourself, um, and um, uh, that actually has gone quite well. But first, we had to overcome our own lack of knowledge on copyright. The loan agreement that we have, it was written a few years back. It has all the usual legal niceties, penalties for theft, damage, etc. And it has a reuse section that puts words in the lender's mouths. Can we use this for commercial purposes? Well, of course, they're fucking going to say no, aren't they? Um, now, Lavery died in 1940. You can all do the maths for that. The majority of the pictures are out of copyright, if not actually all of them. We took the high quality photographs of them for the exhibition catalogue. We should be able to use every single one of them in the public domain. In the end, actually, there are only two that cannot be reproduced. And somewhere I placed the rights statements statement um, of no copyright, non-commercial use only. This was actually more to appease the lenders who are also donors to the museum. And I'm not sure that the purists among you are going to agree with that. Um, the rights statement, that rights statement is actually intended for public, private, large scale digitizations, for instance, with Google. And again, these pictures are not in copyright, they are in the public domain, but it was under a contract that we had with them and I didn't get to it quick enough. The need to educate museum staff um, continued with the writing of the online story. I wanted links out to other museums, galleries, libraries for promotion and knowledge um, uh, and also to include their images in the, the story crediting them. I think I must have put in the Google document that we, we formed to do this over 100 times at least, what is the right statement or copyright? And the answer I got back was, I don't know, got it from the internet or even I got it from Wiki Commons, which is good. Um, and then why did they not then put in the legal statement, the, the legal status against it? And I think it's mainly due to a real lack of understanding of, 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 of copyright and, and how it works. They've all been long, you know, they do what I've been really long guilty of, mention metadata to me and I glaze over, I go into a kind of state of hypnosis. And I think that happens to 90% of people when you mention copyright. Um, so in my view, we've got to get even better and simpler way of getting this message across. What copyright is and it isn't, and the benefits to the museums and the libraries, et cetera, of putting that label on so that their stuff can be extracted, it can be uh, reused. Um, I think the message that came through in uh, The Yellow Milkmaid, which some of you will know about, this was something that Europeana did 10 years ago, is still really valid and really worth going back to if you are having trouble actually getting 
people in your museums to understand why copyright is important and why we should be using it. Anyway, I had the buy-in um, to be able to push everything that we could into the public domain. Uh, but to do that, you actually need some people and some money. I have seven uh, FTEs, um, and we have uh, three collections. The Hunt one is this incredibly eclectic, very uh, wide-ranging. To put it online and to get the money to do it, uh, I'm working on that in some very roundabout ways. Um, to put this in context, the museum lost 100,000 euros. It was 100,000 euros in deficit at the end of 2018. That wasn't my budget, but my budget this year, I'm trying to get to a budget zero on. Uh, so we don't have money. Um, European archaeology is one of the ways that we are getting this collection up online. It is key. And I think uh, the other action, besides copyright, that I'd like to sort of come out of here is that the member states really do need to go back to the Commission and say, why are you removing generic services, which is what European archaeology comes under? Because that is what allows each of the countries and the museums and whatever within that country to do things like uh, digitize, get their collections, the data into the state that it will work online and become fully interoperable. Um, we're in that project. It's allowed us to put in place a basic CMS um, to remake metadata for each of the objects. Ideally, I would have done that straight into Wikidata, but we have no technical people in the museum at all. That means that I don't have internal knowledge in order to be able to at least get you over the first hurdles of, of uh, Wikidata. So a ad lib CMS was the easiest option and at least it gets us started on the path. We're digitizing to at least tier three um, and in many cases tier four uh, standards, not just the digitization, the metadata and the open licenses of the Europeana publishing framework. And this is also where my lack of knowledge is very telling and where European archaeology has come up trumps. Uh, the, uh, they are teaching a member of my team actually how to do this. To do the digitization, we're making use of volunteers. 2D photographs um, be made of about a third of the collection, um, and we're doing 100 3D objects uh, towards uh, European archaeology. We're using a community volunteer group. Um, they digitize using photogrammetry. And then they place the articles, uh, put, place the things on uh, Sketchfab. Some of the objects don't lend themselves to this. Um, and we use students from the Limerick Institute of uh, Technology over the summer to laser scan them. So meet Balthazar and Apollo, um, who before they got conserved uh, were laser scanned and with the aim of making them into virtual beings. This is an unfinished version of Apollo on Sketchfab, um, which actually I've put there because it shows you how long it takes you to do uh, some of these things. Whoops. Um, this is Old McMahon, uh, who has been digitized and put up onto uh, Sketchfab. He's a rather cool little fellow, funerary uh, thing from, I don't know what happened there, but we won't worry about it. Um, this uh, means that so the next part of this is what's also interesting. I am looking at uh, creating a museum in a garden. I want to take these images, which are these things, these objects, which are about this big in the museum, and I want to put them double man size in the garden so that everyone can experience it, play with them, play on it, under it, et cetera, et cetera. We're also looking at making a, a chess set of some of the pieces in the museum that kids can put together and that they play with outside. The reason that this is shown as a golf course is that last week I was involved in the Hunt Museum Pro-Am. I know nothing about golf. Um, and through that Pro-Am, we raised 25,000. I've got, I need another 75, but, you know, I'm on the way um, and getting there. Um, and we have been working with Arup, the really big um, uh, engineering company, and other local engineering companies, plus the Institute of Technology and the University of Limerick, 
to be able to 3D print using sustainable materials such as sand and quarry dust. Um, AI robot, robots to actually be able to move around and to create the images as they're working. Now, one of the issues is you can digitize things this size, you can do bridges, um, you can do things like we saw uh, yesterday from Scan the World. Um, to do something that is double man size and a one-off is really, really not economically viable. And what I'm hoping that comes out of this is that if we get to the point that we can do this, um, you've then actually got a business case to do things like create floodgates. Floodgates are all different sizes for all different places. Um, you want to be able to 3D print them, and then maybe they'll give me some money for the museum. Um, to do the chess set, I am using uh, kids um, to take the plastic tops of bottles. We're giving them digital, uh, digital 3D digitization things, and they are going to make them on site, and then we're going to bring them back into the museum. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Uh, what you've done, been able to do it at the Hunt Museum since just 2018 is uh, amazing. But I was thinking, how, how did this change? Uh, how, how did your staff and uh, your colleagues react to this quick change? You said in the beginning you had yeah. no knowledge and no images and n no nothing, basically. Uh, how, did, how did you get all of this through your staff? Well, there's no advantage of only having seven, <laughs> so you can talk to them all individually. Uh, I think around November of last year, I um, was about to suffer a mutiny um, and had to really sit down and get them back into why we are doing this, why this is part of your job description, that we're not adding in somebody else who is going to do the digital for you. One, because we don't have money. Two, because you need to understand it. And to their credit, they are, um, they are really open uh, people and they want the best for the museum. And because they could see the way the museum was moving out and forward, they were prepared to do it. I did have to make some changes, um, actually try and get them to get rid of stuff um, and to say, OK, we're not doing that. But we've always done that. But no, we're not doing it because you're not getting a return on investment. Let's do this instead. Um, prioritize. So some reluctance, yeah. yeah. We all have to prioritize. Yeah. Uh, questions from the audience? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jill. Uh, I was wondering with the 3D uh, scans and prints of these, um, what looks to me like some prehistoric uh, figures from other cultural regions, um, are there any concerns uh, related to what Andrea was talking about uh, yesterday about sort of being playful with uh, other cultures, uh, you know, uh, cultural yeah. artifacts? Yeah. Um, actually, probably less uh, things like Olmec Man, because that civilization is completely dead. There's no body left from there. Um, they, uh, more to do with, I have a lot of medieval Irish um, artifacts. And we are being a little bit careful about that in terms of the sensitivities that that might uh, come up with. But then we do have stuff from everywhere else. And I do think we have to take that on board when we are uh, deciding what goes into the garden. Fortunately, Egyptian, Greek, Roman, we're probably fairly safe about. Um, I'm glad you didn't ask me about restitution, and please don't. <laughs> um, I do think um, in some ways we should keep the digital and give the, the real thing back, but um, then we don't have the museum, so it's a very difficult place uh, to be. 
Larissa. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm really curious about your three dimensions that you're also now able to see and that you kind of um, not use the words analog and digital, <laughs> which yeah. is really great. Um, how do you actually differentiate between um, physical, virtual and human? Um, in terms of what people are doing or...? Where you see the difference between, for example, the dimensions physical and virtual and the human um, dimension in there. I don't quite understand. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can have a chat about that later. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe somebody else can help me. I, I mean... Oh, this. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Oh, sorry. This thing behind me. This is really the platforms. So I have a, a physical platform, which is the museum and the collections. I have the humans who are making it happen. That's my network. That's my community. That's all the partnerships, that kind of thing. And uh, the virtual is really when we make this stuff available digitally. Um, and it can cover everything from the social media platforms to... Uh, what you put up on Sketchfab um, to 3D printing, actually, um, uh, in the end. Yeah, sorry. Even my own words, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jill. So we have a, a, a slot of, uh, with the, for lightning talks before lunch. Uh, it's going to be really exciting to see uh, what these guys have to say. So first out is uh, Anja Müller uh, from uh, DGS. It's Digis. Digis in uh, Berlin. Yeah, exactly, uh, Germany. Uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. How do I change here? Sorry. Um, I'm a bit lost where... Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so thanks for the invitation, Leah. Um, my name is Anja Müller. I work as the coordinator at the Berlin Digitalization Coordination Center. In short, we are called DIGIS, <laughs> so it's quite easy. Um, DIGIS supports cultural heritage institutions on their way into the digital realm. And um, of course, this is a really data-driven undertaking. But um, let me tell you furthermore, and not less, it's about communication, it's about communities, and it's about corporations. When uh, we started our task in 2012, we had to embrace a long process of mutual understanding about our partners' needs and had to initiate a dialogue with a variety of people and organizations from all cultural areas. You can see a little bit here, this is the partner logo network. Um, on the right side are the cultural institutions on the left other partners from the network. In uh, 2012, the Berlin Cultural Institutions were called by the Senate for Cultural Affairs for the very first time to digitalize their collection um, within the new digitalization funding program. And up to now, 37 institutions of all sizes and from all cultural areas have followed this call and opened up parts of Berlin's treasures of art and history online. And um, some of them have even succeeded in making their data available for open reuse. Unfortunately, this is not an obligation um, within this funding program. Digitalization in its broadest sense challenges the institutions in terms of organizational structures of new legal and technological competencies, and it forces them to overcome the traditional mindset of being the gatekeepers of knowledge and of history. And so that's why we as DIGIS also need support in our work from, um, from other network partners. Some of them are listed here on the left. These are organizations like Wikimedia or the Open Knowledge Foundation or the Berlin Open Access Office. So representatives of free knowledge. We cooperate with lawyers so we have, uh, that have expertise in copyright issues. We have a strong technical infrastructure partner. This is the ZUSE Institute Berlin, which is the leading data processing center. And we have spot, uh, partners with expertises in strategical topics. Yeah, and just to share some of the outcomes of our project corporations, for example, this year is the, um, the bone cellar of the Natural History Museum of Berlin. These are really, uh, it's a dinosaur, a collection of dinosaur bones that were digitalized um, 
by photogrammetic methods, micro CT and laser scans, and uh, supplemented data of the scientific publications. And um, you can find this here online. So um, digitization made accessible a collection which had only been stored in the depot before. Another example, this is um, the playbook of Danton's death from the author Max Reinhardt from 1916. The drama itself was considered unrepresentable on stage until Reinhardt, he translated it into his famous playbook. And some of these pages were presented in a multi-level way for digital edition according to the TI guidelines. Some of you guys might have heard about this. And um, finally, this is a collection of private photos from the Berlin Wall. They were published on an open license, and so these data were used to build the augmented reality app Berlin Mauer during the Coding Da Vinci, um, Coding da Vinci Data Hackathon um, two years ago in Berlin. And um, with the app, you can jump through the decades and see how the wall had changed from barbed wire border to a really massive, um, massive wall. So the concept behind all this is really uh, to enable the Berlin GLAM partners of ours to gain experiences of good practices and to share them within the network. And our main task as DIGIS is to accompany the institutions during the whole digitalization workflow. So starting directly with advice on how to apply for the funding, offering technical services and one-to-one -one consultations regarding all digitalization issues, but really focusing on questions of metadata quality. So we aggregate, for example, the metadata of our partners and the data for the German Digital Library and also for other uh, portals and platforms. And furthermore, oh, sorry. <laughs> and furthermore, um, every interested person benefits um, from an extensive and cost-free workshop program, which places all topics related to digitization at its core. I have to mention that we have a funding volume in total of 600,000 uh, euros per year, and we have to really strive to keep projects small. Our most cherished outcomes are reliable, accessible, and interoperable data from lucky and smarter cultural institutions. Which brings me to my nearly last point. This is the long-term availability. This, as you all know, starts at the beginning of each digitalization project, and it's all about maintaining the context of data. And, um, the funding includes, for a period over 10 years, the costs of all digital preservation for all data collected. And at this point, I think the funding moves from being short-term, from being an infrastructure, um, an investment in infrastructure. The ZUSE Institute, our uh, infrastructural partner, and DIGIS, we established a joint working group in order to develop an open source-based long-term availability system. You can see the different components here on the, on the slide. Yes, and right before the end of my talk, I'm just going to draw your attention to the still missing actor in this Berlin scenario. It's the user of the cultural data. Um, 2014, Digis had the good fortune to set up the first cultural data hackathon together with um, partners from Wikimedia, Open Knowledge Foundation, and German Digital Library. It's called Coding Da Vinci. And Coding Da Vinci unites the cultural lovers and the cultural data lovers um, in the development of applications on using open data. And the format will be introduced to you by Philip right after here my talk. So yeah, finally, what I can share is the Berlin experience, the recipe maybe, of how to install a successful digitalization infrastructure in the broadest sense of its meaning. Is first of all, you need a vision and a concept that has the potential to show the results quickly. You need political will to ensure sustainability. You need infrastructure partners, and you need a permanent and proactive dialogue with your communities and the challenges they are facing. This was it. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Anya. Uh, shall I take a headset and maybe just you want the mic? Great. Should be on. It is. That's off. <laughs> Just put it down there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Philip, Jenny. That's me. It? That's you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so you're talking about coding Da Vinci, as you said. Okay, so I'll just 
hand it over to you and we'll get your presentation up and running. Um, there you go. Wonderful, thank you. Yes, my name is Philippe Jeunet, as you have all heard. Um, and um, I lead the headquarters office of Coding Da Vinci, the first uh, German hackathon focusing on uh, open cultural data, as Anja already introduced. And um, I will not bore you about with uh, details about what Coding Da Vinci is and how it works, since um, many of you might also have heard of that before. Uh, however, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions concerning our hackathon after this talk. What I want to share with you today is um, our not yet official plans uh, to make the Coding Da Vinci experience last beyond the hackathons themselves. We believe that um, increasing the impact and building a joint community are vital for the success of Coding Da Vinci. Since the hackathon moves regionally within Germany at every turn, it is most important to take advantage of the positive momentum created by the confrontation of GLAMS and the open data and creative tech communities and extend it into lasting relations. A key feature we envision is an incubation program that is made possible by a major funding of the German Federal Cultural Foundation. At every hackathon, up to 20,000 euros are available to boost the development of one of the generated projects. In order to design a program that makes sense to both groups alike, GLAMS and hackers, we ran a survey among former Coding Da Vinci participants. The results showed that although GLAMS were open to offer residencies, Hackers preferred to develop their projects independently as a team while keeping in close touch with the GLAM institutions. Among the proposed types of support, hackers opted almost unanimously for the direct financial help to compensate their loss of, of income due to the work time they have to invest on their project. Additional interviews revealed that appreciation for their work played also a very important role for them and the greatest esteem to them is seeing their inventions being in active use. We designed the incubation according to these findings. The main focus is now to buy time for one incubated project per hackathon with direct financial support at the free disposal of the team lasting for, four, for 24 weeks. In addition to the supported team, um, in addition, comma, the supported team will commit to reporting regularly on their progress in a blog and to presenting their project at the following hackathon. Another main feature of the incubation is a mandatory workshop and coaching program to help raise the quality of the projects. We hope the incubation program to achieve four goals. Teams can put their ideas into practice and have a maximum of freedom in doing so. The mandatory workshops and coachings ensure high quality and usability standards. The incubation creates success stories within the open data context that can be used for public relations by the supported team and Coding Da Vinci alike. And GLAMS may be more inclined to seriously consider implementing a Coding Da Vinci project in their exhibitions or websites. So this was a rough outline of our incubation program to be initialized by mid-October. I would very much appreciate your feedback and please feel free to approach me later with questions or suggestions. And finally, I would like to invite you to our next Coding Da Vinci Hackathon taking place in Dortmund. And if you happen to attend the Frankfurt Book Fair, please make sure to drop by our two Coding Da Vinci events on Friday, August 18th at the Arts Plus in Hall 4.1. And that's it, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Philip. Uh, put it there, yeah.
And now we have Victor Janssen from, from um, our National Heritage Board. He's going to tell us all about supporting our startups. Yeah. Uh, and um, I actually need to do a quick computer switch, as okay. always. So in the meantime, you can... Um, do you want the mic or the headset? Come on, guys. Sorry about this. It's on its way. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Victor and I work for the National Heritage Board here in Sweden. Uh, and the last one and a half year, me and um, my team has uh, run a project called Kulturarvs Inkubaton, uh, the Cultural Heritage Incubator. Pretty difficult in both English and Swedish to say. Uh, our task is to run an incubator program. Uh, where startups, small companies, and people from the glam sector get support to uh, together bring new innovative ideas to life. Uh, our program consists of uh, workshops, design help, and business counseling. Uh, we also give them access to an office and our workshop in Visby. And all of this is for free. During this spring, we have had eight companies within the incubator, and this week, five new entrepreneurs will start in the program. You might ask yourself why a government agency should support private startups. Uh, and I usually say that in the assignment of the National Heritage Board, uh, one of our main tasks is to make sure that uh, the cultural heritage are being preserved, developed and used and I think that if you would like to influence the society in its whole you can't exclude the private companies because they are such important part and also we can make use of their innovation power to bring new life uh, bring new ideas to life uh, I would just like to give you one short example of one of the projects we have worked on during this spring uh, this is a company from uh, Norrköping called the Track You Back. Uh, they are uh, three developers, software developers. 
uh, but uh, a strong interest in uh, genealogy. And they have m made a service called Track You Back, obviously. And their idea is to connect open data to you and your family's history. So you start the search with like typing in your own name and perhaps your family tree. And then they gather data from several sources. It could be a picture of the house where your grandmother grew up. It can be a court record or something like that. Uh, the company has recently uh, received external funding. So they are now in to uh, further development and are aiming to launch their new product in, uh, during 2020. Startups like Track You Back and uh, our other companies, um, they rely on open data and its providers to make this happen. And therefore, I just made a short list of some things that I find extra important if you want to see this happen at more places. Uh, you can see them as five simple advice for happy marriage. First of all, as I said, uh, startup companies uh, which build their innovation on open data relies on the fact that you as a provider of information have a long-term long -term plan for your service. As you provide them with one of the most valuable resources in their company, they need to access this 24-7 today, but also in a foreseeable future. You can just imagine what happens if you shut down your service without further notice and uh, yeah, they stand with a product that it's worthless. Um, as I talk about marriage, I just want to underline this, that of course you should have an open relationship. There will be companies that will contact you and perhaps will do some kind of exclusive agreement. Just tell them no. Next thing is that you should remember your anniversary, or at least remember to talk to your partners, the startup, at a regular basis. Make sure to inform your partner if you're about to make any big changes in your service and do it well in advance so they can prepare themselves. <laughs> but also be curious, ask questions, because you know communication is one key to a happy marriage. Be supportive, they will have some rough times. And of course, it isn't your responsibility to solve all their problems, but listen to them, because I think some of the things they say might be a key for your further development. And of course, before you run away and do anything of this, make sure to have a good prenup. Because a private company and, for example, a museum are two very different kind of institutions uh, with uh, uh, very different conditions. Uh, make sure to make this prenup before you enter the collaboration. It could be a rather simple standard agreement uh, that, provide, that tells what service you provide, uh, terms and conditions and so on. I think that uh, we would need to see more innovative startups like Track You Back and others here in Sweden and all over Europe. And me and my team are more than glad to be a part of it to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Now we uh, switch over to Erik Olsson from um Ray Space in, in North Shipping. Um, he's the guy that developed our app that runs on the 3D screen out in the um, exhibition. Uh, get away. Hello, my name is Eric, and uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, how we develop uh, the 3D viewer for cultural heritage. And um, the idea came up when uh, the Royal Armory wanted to 
install a touch screen in the museum to make the visitors interact with the 3D models. And uh, these 3D models had uh, Eric Lannestone uh, already reconstructed from uh, photos uh, by using a technique called photogrammetry. So, and um, he asked me if I could help him with the um, uh, implementation of the application. And at that moment, he used Sketchfab to show the 3D models. So I started to look uh, what we could use Sketchfab. And I found that it uh, has a lot of benefits. Uh, yeah, number one is that uh, Sketchfab has a viewer API written in JavaScript. And uh, yeah, uh, the, you could also like develop the application from scratch, but uh, there's no point to do it when, when I found all the benefits with uh, Sketchfab. Uh, what I like most about Sketchfab is the result of the rendering, uh, the, the lighting and the shadowing and everything looks really good. Uh, and uh, there are also settings in this uh, uh, on Sketchfab where you can uh, tweak the, the, the rendering settings like changing the light and the render methods and adding normal maps and stuff like that. So I uh, decided to use Sketchfab and uh, the requirements was to, uh, they wanted to show something like eight to nine models and then you need a database to store these uh, models. Uh, so I decided to use Sketchfab, <laughs> no, uh, WordPress because uh, Many is uh, familiar to WordPress and it's easy to use. So uh, the application is nothing else than a, a WordPress theme. And uh, yeah, you can also uh, develop your own plugins uh, to customize the, the WordPress theme. Um, so here is... Uh, a picture of the database table. There is uh, nine models uh, that is inserted. And uh, yeah, you do it with like creating a new post and then you come to uh, this, uh, this page where you uh, type in all the settings for the model. This is annotations uh, and one annotation is uh, it's like a point on the, on the model. Uh, where the camera will zoom in and uh, a text box will appear with some uh, information about this uh, detail. And uh, you can also change the like, sensitivity of the model, uh, adding some uh, help information, both in English and Swedish and stuff like that. Uh, and I think... Um, some of you already have tried uh, tried uh, the application in the museum. Uh, this this is a movie about how it looks, but I don't think I can run it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, you will find uh, find the Freedom Viewer in the first room in the museum, uh, and. Uh, yeah, you can, uh, it, uh, it's able to load between eight to nine models. Uh, if you want to add more than that, the application uh, probably will crash because of it's written in uh, JavaScript and uh, JavaScript is not really designed for um, uploading big amounts of uh, data to the GPU. So that's why why it's limited to like eight to nine models. Uh, and the screen um, quality has also a really big impact on the user experience. Uh, when I was to develop the application, I used a really cheap one. Um, but when I came to, came here, uh, 
they used the, the Royal Armor, Armory using a more expensive one, and there, there was a really big difference. Uh, and yeah, the last thing I want to say is uh, the code for this application is open source, so it's free to use and uh, free to edit. Uh, you can uh, download it from our GitHub page and follow the instruction to to install the application. And I hope someone will take a look on it. Uh, and uh, I hope you will enjoy the application. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>